The scripture lesson for the morning it comes from 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, the 10th chapter. Listen for the word of the Lord. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that as he is Christ's, so are we. Not that we venture to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limit, but will keep to the limits God has apportioned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. We were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in other men's labors, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our field among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's field. Let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we start a new sermon series entitled, Draw the Circle Wide. The title is inspired from a song from Mark Miller, and you will hear the choir sing part of it today, and you will hear it as well throughout the month. The words of the chorus are, draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, will stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. With all this talk about drawing circles, I couldn't help but think about shapes. And as I was thinking about shapes, I couldn't help but think about geometry. Well, it's probably because my son just started high school this year and he's taking geometry. And I myself am in a doctor of ministry program and um, I'm doing some theology. And so when I looked uh, through my son's geometry book, and the book is about this thick, no over-exaggeration. I kind of reminisce to when I was taking geometry, and I realized as I thumbed through the book, yeah, geometry hasn't changed much. <laughs> geometry, geometry is still the study of shapes, knowing their properties and how to measure them. <clears throat> And as my son was doing his geometry homework last week, he was talking to a friend, and he, I, I overheard them say, what does all this have to do with life? <laughs> Our youth, Journey Youth Choir was singing this morning. They were like, yes, what does all of this have to do with life? <laughs> well, shapes are everywhere in our life. There are four-sided shapes of squares and rectangles, as we can see from this kitchen. And uh, this is a, a very beautiful kitchen. It's not my kitchen, but... <laughs> but we're looking at the shapes in this kitchen. <laughs> then there are three-sided shapes, a triangle, which we see from this musical instrument. There are five-sided shapes called pentagons and eight-sided shapes called octagons, and our favorite one that we see most of the time is a stop sign. And then earlier this year, a bunch of us went on a trip to the Holy Land, and some folks, after they left to the Holy Land, went on to Egypt, and so they got to see a pyra some pyramids, which are also representative of some shapes. And I can imagine that by now some of you are asking, oh, this is all really nice, but what does this have to do with our faith? Well, as I was thinking about it, shapes are an important part of our faith. 
We believe in a triune God, God, God the Father, Son, and Spirit. And as good Methodists, we acknowledge, as John Wesley did, that the living core of the Christian faith is revealed in Scripture, illumined in tra tradition, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed by reason. And that has become known as the quadrilateral, which is a four-sided shape. And then we live out our faith with our devotion to God, represented by a vertical line, as well as our relationship with others, represented by a horizontal line. Now that doesn't leave us with a shape, but the two intersecting lines leaves us with a cross. Today's scripture passage, the Apostle Paul was telling the Corinthian community that geometry has everything to do with their faith how you view God's grace, how they were to view themselves, how they were to view others, and how they were to see their mission to spread the gospel, according to Paul, was a geometric concept. You see, Paul was in the midst of a very passionate conversation with this community. There were some that were questioning his authority and Paul was dealing from opposition, not only from outside of the community, but also within the community. And he was not pleased with their behavior. From what Paul says in this letter, it sounds like they had taken on a very arrogant attitude in the way they were including some and excluding others from the faith. And then they were comparing themselves to others and speaking highly about themselves and putting others down. And so Paul brings in this geometric concept of shapes and measurements and the main shape that Paul was concerned about was the shape of their attitude and their mission. He called it their sphere of influence. And he talks about measurements and the dangers of how you use those measurements. And so Paul uses this image of a sphere of influence to help them understand God themselves and their mission. And he helps to point them to do some good geometric theology. Paul's first point was, if your circle only includes you, you are not drawing your circle wide enough. Paul tells his audience in verse seven, if you are confident that you belong to Christ, remind yourself of this, that others belong to Christ as well. Paul was writing this at a time where the church was experiencing tremendous growth. And we already sensed that the church was getting a little bit too confident and set in its ways. In verse 14, Paul points them and reminds them that there was a time that you yourself didn't know Christ and others reached out to share the love of Christ with you. Now, their concept of church and faith had become rather exclusive and Paul called them on it. In other words, their understanding of Christ's love and their circle looked a little like this. A circle with a big me and not a lot of space for anybody else. Their concept of Christ's love was almost exclusively about them. It didn't include others and if it did, it was very out of balance and might have looked a little like that. A circle that the, the circle that Paul was seeing in their action was very limited in their understanding. Well, how does one of faith and our view of faith become so skewed and limited like this? Well, I, I want to share this morning, it's not really hard for our opinions to get so set in their ways, especially if you have been around the church for a long time. 
A couple of years ago, I went back to my mother's hometown in Mississippi, and I went by the church that she grew up in. It's a Methodist church, and I remember as I was growing up, going to Mississippi and visiting the church and worshiping there. And on the left side of the church where that bush is, there is a cornerstone. And you'll see that cornerstone on the right side of the screen. In the cornerstone, there are the names of my great-grandfather and great-grandmother and some other family members who were charter members of the church. So for me, I've been around Methodism for a long time. Methodism kind of runs in the family, if you will. And if I am not careful, I will begin to think that since my family has been around the Methodist Church for years, we know how to do church. Isn't that dangerous? I think this is what was happening to the folks in Corinth. They were well-meaning people, but they began to take exclusive ownership of the faith and forgot the essence of their mission. They were beginning to take on this exclusive attitude. And so Paul's advice was, well, if you think you are the center, you need to draw your circle wider. Adjust your concept of yourself so that your circle looks a little more like this. There's nothing wrong with being confident that you belong to Christ, Paul says, but also remember that others belong to Christ as well. Paul's second point in his geometric theology is related to the first, and it is, if there is a group or a community or a perspective that you intentionally leave outside of your circle, you're not drawing your circle wide enough. In other words, your circle might look a little like this. You see, this Corinthian community's attitude was causing them to compare and measure themselves against others and put others down. And Paul begs the community to avoid judgment like that. As a matter of fact, Paul's language was a little bit stronger. And he said, it really doesn't make sense for you to compare yourself with others like that. He begs the community and encourage them not to do this type of activity because when we dispute about matters of faith, no one wins. And so Paul strongly admonishes the community in verse 8 to realize that the grace that we have been given from God is for building up and not for tearing people down. Unity is not an option, I can hear Paul saying. It's a gift to be received and expressed, and it is achieved by support and not by tearing others down. Paul's words are encouraging them to say, if you feel yourself digging your heels into the ground and not budging on your opinion, remember that God did not deposit the whole of God's truth in you. We each have but a portion of the total picture of God's grace, even non-Christians or people that don't have the same belief systems as us. Even they can help us as we are in our life and our ministry, and they will also help us to have a more complete picture of God's grace. And so Paul is encouraging the Corinthian community to draw their circle wide so that it looks a little something like this. The third point of Paul's geometric theology is the good news. The good news is, as you expand your circle, your faith grows. In verse 15, Paul encourages the Corinthians that as they set their hope on Christ, their faith increases. And as their faith increases, so will their sphere of action. 
And as their sphere of action increases, so will their faith. And this is the cycle of how the gospel gets spread. Today is World Communion Sunday. And World Communion Sunday has become one of my favorite Sundays. I enjoyed this Sunday just as much as I enjoy Christmas Eve and Easter, which are very central to our faith. Why has this day become so important to me? Well, personally, in 1994, I was one of 23 students selected throughout United Methodism to receive the scholarship that today's offering goes to. I am proud of our denomination's commitment to draw the circle wide and to support racial and ethnic minority students who are pursuing educational endeavors. Another reason why this Sunday has become so important to me, that for the past 15 years since I have been here, I rejoice that we intentionally celebrate who we are in all of our hues and our views. We don't have to look alike. We don't have to think alike. We don't have to talk alike or dress alike or even speak the same language. But yet we honor who each of us is in the kingdom of God. But our observance of World Communion Sunday does not just stop on today's worship. For us, we have been impacted by realizing who we are as diverse as we are in God's kingdom. Because we have started to draw our circle wide, what we say throughout the year is that issues that impact you also impact me. Because we are encircled by God's love and God's grace, the things that concern me are things that concern you as well. Because of how diverse we are, we have to search wide to find a them that is not already us. Our faith has grown because we have been challenged in ministry to see that the joys and the pains of others become our joys and our pains. And that's a true embrace of the kingdom of God. As we raise awareness of social issues, and we have had no limit of social issues to raise lately, but not only to raise the issues, but also to engage in mission and ministry on some of those issues with the joys and the pains of the world. When we do that, we proclaim that no one stands alone. In a few months, we will open our newest facilities and it is yet another opportunity for our faith to grow. We have been clear in saying each time that we consider to build and each time we open up a new facility that our facilities facilitate our mission. We're drawing our circle wide. We're reminding ourselves that no one stands alone. We walk side by side. God's love and God's grace is bigger than us, brothers and sisters. And as we open up our new facilities, we open our doors to welcome people for Christ, to grow people in Christ, and to serve people with Christ. The new people that come in and as we go out into the world helps us to remember to draw our circle wide. May it be so. Amen.